Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, was, the, was the keynote interesting this morning? It's fine. Yes. No? Morning, Des. Anything exciting? Lee Pampion. You want to share? No, we're not in the sharing mood. Okay. <laughs> no. It's too early in the morning. Okay. Uh, so it'll just be me sharing. Um, so this is, a, this is quite a new talk uh, I've done. Um, and so very open to questions, if you've got any ideas, any queries, any comments, any examples of what you've been doing in this, in this kind of area, um, again, feel free to kind of, uh, raise your hand or, or shout some, uh, some interesting stuff. And, uh, it doesn't just have to be me kind of doing the slides, it can be you kind of asking questions and we'll see what we do there. Because everybody's got a different background, I imagine. Um, so this talk is really going to be quite quite a high level. Um, it, it's a big area of continuous uh, deployment, continuous delivery. Just trying to do continuous integration in one kind of session is is an awful lot to kind of cover. So I'm not going to turn, go into too much detail. It, it's quite, quite a broad kind of uh, range of topics. Uh, so if you're looking for lots and lots of technical stuff, uh, there's some Java stuff next door, which would be much more uh, your thing. But trying to kind of set the scene for what continuous deployment is, how I see it, how I've seen kind of it working and not working in different organisations, and um, trying to get um, uh, like the big picture really of what continuous deployment is and, and why you should try and move towards it. So, does anybody feel that they're actually doing continuous deployment or continuous delivery at the moment? There's a few. Um, is anybody doing continuous integration builds and stuff like that? Okay, so I won't go into too much detail of that. You probably already kind of know that. Maybe I'll touch on that because it's an important aspect. Um, who actually understands the business in which they're working in? <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's that's what I imagined. Okay, so we'll, we'll make a start. Uh, let's, uh, let's see. Yeah, here we go. So I'm, I'm John Stevenson. Um, so I've been a, a lean and agile coach for quite a while, uh, doing a lot of different aspects. So I'm, I'm a geek. I'm, I'm growing up from doing uh, development and working on projects uh, to getting into more of the agile space and uh, teaching people uh, uh, lean and agile practices. And um, so I'm a bit of a, a geek on Kanban and kind of visualizing the workspace. So we'll talk about that briefly as well. <laughs> um, and I also get involved in a lot of community stuff as well, and 
the nice thing about London and the UK, there's such a vibrant kind of community. Um, so it, it's great that you've come to Jack's. If you want to continue kind of with that learning, then sort of reach out to your local communities, whether that be London or wherever you are. There, there's a huge number of, of, of really interesting things going on there. So, uh, and it's a great way that I've kind of learnt so much more than I would have done just by myself, by going to communities and getting involved in their activities. Uh, and in my spare time, I dabble with Clojure, uh, which is a functional programming language. And again, it's a, it kind of, it's a nice way to kind of think about a problem because you, you have to think about how you would do the problem in the language. It, it's, it's more about thinking than it is typing, which some of the languages uh, make you do. So it's, uh, uh, it's me, blah, 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 blah. So what is continuous deployment? Anybody want to offer any sound bites on what they think continuous deployment is? No, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> okay, so fair enough. Uh, for me, it's incredibly hard. It's a very hard thing to do. Continuous deployment isn't something you just turn up one day and say, okay, we're gonna do it. Uh, just like Agile isn't something you can kind of, oh, we'll just do it. Maybe even unit tests. Doing unit tests, if you're not already doing those things on your code, you can start doing it uh, when you turn up Monday morning. But to get good at it and to get a whole bunch of tests that are effective, that are useful, is very hard. It takes time, it takes experience. And for me, uh, continuous delivery is a combination of all these kind of aspects and even more uh, put together to really allow you to deliver software effectively. Uh, and the way you do that is to understand your role and everybody else's role in the organization. So it, it's, it's a big deal. And um, even if you're a startup, even if there's like uh, two or three of you, then it, it's very hard to kind of do. Um, you've got a lot of challenges, uh, and you've got li limited resources as well. But at least you are a very small team, you're talking to each other, you're, you're more aware of what's going on around you in a small team compared to an enterprise team where you've got things like huge technical debt all around you, you've got huge enterprise systems all around you, uh, you've got some evil processes you have to kind of follow, otherwise you get taken up and shot. Um, a lot of big companies have are very apathetic users. They, they, they are there, they do their work, and they, they grudgingly use the systems that you build for them. Uh, and it's a shame that we we can't all be in a, a company where our, our customers are delighted by the stuff. They actually love using our product. Uh, it's the main, uh, the main bulk of us are actually producing stuff that's just good enough to get the work done, or sometimes not even that good. Um, so it really is a sort of an ex extraordinary kind of effort to kind of move from that situation to continuous delivery. So most people will find it incredibly hard, but it's still kind of worth doing. Uh, so an example of uh, a really good sort of continuous deployment organization is company called Ford. And they're quite a small company, and they work in very small teams. So typically you have a developer and a business focused person working hand in hand, and they will go from just a simple idea, they'll put up like a simple, they do a lot of business on the web, basically. They put up uh, some websites. So uh, a case study here is that they did, they, they basically built this uh, business called uh, Just Cages from a simple idea that somebody went online and tried to find a, a, a parrot cage and couldn't actually find it, couldn't find it anywhere. There was nobody in the UK that actually supplied parrot cages. And, but then there was, they looked on Google Analytics and they found that lots of people were kind of searching for uh, parrot cages and not finding them. So just to kind of test that out a bit more, see if actually people would buy it, they knocked up a very simple website, took them less than a day, um, and then really kind of tried to understand if there was actually a need for this business. And quickly, within a week, they found out that there was a huge amount of people wanting to buy. They're going on there, they're pressing the buy now, they weren't actually getting anything, the, because there was no business. This was a fake business. But it wasn't done in, in an evil way. It was done to decide whether there should be a business like this. And it's an extreme example of, uh, of, kind of just delivering just enough to find out whether you should deliver more. 
So they basically got a whole bunch of people's emails. So people were leaving their emails saying, because uh, we were asking, well, if you want a bird cage, we can get in touch with you when we start supplying it. And lots of people did leave their emails. So they went from just an email thing, they, 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 over a couple of weeks, they got so much interest, it was actually worth building like an online system to actually buy it. And then they realized, well, okay, well, we've got all these customers, we've got all these orders, but now we actually need to ship some bird cages to these people. We don't do that, we, we build software. So they just worked out all the logistics, found a company in China that made bird cages. They found uh, a sort of docking company that would actually take those cages delivered from China, process them, and then deliver them to the addresses that they supply. So they never even saw a bird cage themselves. They didn't really care what a bird cage looked like, really. Just people wanted to buy these. They created a simple website to enable people to buy it, uh, and they just iterated on that. And they could deploy uh, changes and updates. Typically, they do 25 deploys to live, to production, to the customers every day for each developer. So you probably just have one, one or two developers kind of working on them that business to start with. And then as the business grew, you develop more and more services and you, you, it'd be worth, it'd be valuable to the company to add more and more resources to that um, and build up the business. And uh, within a few months, it became the most successful kind of uh, retailer for that kind of that product. And it actually started taking over um, to companies who are sort of, uh, not based on the internet. Uh, and actually buying it, things, and now they're kind of the major re retailer in the UK for for that for, for bird cages. So it was quite amazing, kind of what you can actually achieve. But that's when they're a startup and they don't have all the legacy that, that you guys have. So for me, that's kind of a nice vision to think about: where you're going, how you're actually going to get there, what is the value of, of kind of doing all this work? Because there's a like hole. Haven't understood that last lastly correctly. Every yeah. day, each developer is deploying a new version of the system 25 times during the day. They're doing deployments. Now, this is the interesting aspect of continuous deployment. We're not shipping a huge enterprise service bus with a NoSQL database every 25 times a day. We're shipping changes to the system, to a live system, yeah. but they're only small changes. <laughs> So actually, even, actually, then, even then, 25, even then yes, yeah. 25 reasons. It is quite a lot, but some of those changes might just be wording on the page. Some of them might be a rearrangement of the form. Some of them might be uh, uh, database changes to put extra fields in the database table so we can capture more information. Uh, but every, every change is kind of assessed with the risk of that deployment. So because they know what they're doing, they know the value of the business at that point, they can they have a much better understanding of the risk of deploying it. So they have more confidence in doing that. And if it fails, they haven't wasted as much. They haven't spent six months kind of developing this and betting all their business on that deployment. So if it goes wrong, then they'll use, they, they might just they might collapse the business, but that's one business that they, they lose over several other. And their attitude really is that they're not worried about the business failing, they're worried about missing an opportunity to start a new business. And that's a very different attitude I, I respect that most people have. But it, it's something to kind of think about, well, how can we kind of get the most value out of our, out of our company? Yeah. So uh, there, there are other companies that kind of develop, uh, that do 50 deployments a day or more. Uh, people get Facebook or Google kind of thing. But that's over the whole, that's not per developer. I, I, I mean, it's per developer thing, though. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. Not, there's only maybe 20 developers in the, the whole company, but then they have uh, at least a dozen businesses. So, and if you factor all that in, it, it's, it seems quite a lot, but it's, it's not actually, it's not radically changing everything every day. It, it's incrementally changing a bunch of things as you grow. Uh, so why go for continuous deployment? Um, so, well, it, it's, it's something to aspire to. It's something to try and make better the things that you do. Um, it's not really for people who just want to turn up 9 to 5 and that's their job. Continuous deployment or even continuous integration or any kind of thing, or any kind of work really isn't really, you know, if you don't have that drive to kind of get better, a little bit better every day, then these things are kind of really irrelevant really. But then probably so will be the business 
uh, in a few years' time, if it's not growing, if it's not learning, um, will it actually survive? Uh, so you need kind of passion for what you're doing, thinking about innovation. Um, again, th there's no strict way of doing continuous integration. I mean, there's, there's some very good books on things like continuous delivery and uh, continuous integration, but there's no sort of recipe for doing continuous deployment. There's lots of really great ideas, but there, I think there's still not a lot more to come out yet. Uh, and for me, a lot of it is about being effective. Uh, how, how, more, how more effective can you be? What can you do? What's the next thing you can do to make yourself a bit more effective? Uh, but not just you, you have to think in terms of the organisation as well. Uh, a lean principle is that you shouldn't do a, 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 a local optimization. You shouldn't just make yourself better. You should make the whole organisation better. Because making yourself better might not have any impact and might even have a detrimental impact. So the bigger view you have over the changes you're making, the more you can think about how effective that change is within your world. Really. Um, and so thinking about business, again, it can be quite hard. Again, uh, most people say they weren't quite sure how, uh, how the business worked, what the, the valuable aspects of the business were. One way of doing that is to think about well, what, what's common, what's the basics we need uh, for the business just to, just to be in business. Uh, so obviously if you're a mobile phone operator, then you, you need to be able to have a, a mobile phone network or be able to use somebody else's. Uh, so you, you'd either have your own, establish your own, or you'd use BTs or whatever. If you want to deliver broad, broadband, uh, yeah, you'd have to kind of deliver, uh, you'd have to either have your own cabling system, like Virgin, or you'd have to rely on BT. But understanding the difference between what's commodity and what's, what makes you special. So why would you go to one particular broadband provider or another? That's a differentiator. And if you understand that, that's, that's the valuable stuff you want to be working at. And that's the thing you would potentially take more risk on. And consider that, okay, well, that's the stuff we really want to spend our energy on. Whereas the commodity stuff, let's buy it off the shelf, let's get somebody else to do that. Because it, it's, it's plumbing, right? Which either should be automated or it should be somebody else's responsibility because we want to work on something that gives the business more value. Uh, and we don't want to be bored. We want to do something exciting. And continuous deployment, continuous delivery is the the next thing really. Um, but for me, this, this is a, a really interesting, I mean it's not scientific this, but it's a, it's a very good kind of representation of if you're doing frequent deployments, then the kind of level of risk, the level of pain that you're actually going through eventually goes down the, the more often you do it. Um, so if you're delivering, if, if you're deploying something, um, and you're doing it once a year, that's only once a year you actually have an opportunity to learn how to do that better because all the rest of the year you're kind of doing everything to actually get that, uh, to build it, construct it, to have meetings and so on. If you're doing a, a daily deployment, then you're doing very small changes, it's very simple, you get feedback all the time, you having less risk because it's so much easier to roll that back. Uh, a simple change done once a day, it's so much easier to roll back than a big change you've done uh, over six months because a lot of things will happen over those six months. Uh, so where to get started? Um, so there's a lot of companies that really aren't ready for this. There's so much kind of going on um, that sometimes you have to start with just basic stuff. Um, and change can be expensive and can be very, very uh, challenging, a long road of disappointment trying to get continuous, integrate, continuous uh, deployment going. Uh, and you need to kind of involve the whole business. Uh, and everybody from the web developers, uh, testers, the, the business people, everybody kind of, the more you work as a team, rather than kind of just giving work to each other, saying, okay, work on that work as a team. So this is a, this is a feature we want to develop, we want to get. So there's an understanding of why the company wants to develop that feature. There's an understanding of the implications of deploying that feature. There's an understanding of how to test that feature and make sure it's it's interesting to the customers. There's an understanding of which customers should we actually deploy it to. Because not you don't necessarily have to deploy everything that you create to every customer. They're all different. 
So getting an understanding of the value you pre uh, pre uh, provide to customers is, is very important. And understanding the motivation of why you're doing all this in the first place is also very important. So everybody's going to have a different goal about why they should be doing continuous deployment. Um, so for me, uh, again, I'm slightly biased because I am quite heavily in, in, involved in Kanban and teaching people how to visualize their work. But if you visualize what you're actually doing uh, and, and make it visual, visual uh, and this is very hard because you're actually just exposing all the, the issues that you're actually going to get, you, you get a, a huge wall of facts, a huge wall of information that people can't really argue against. You're saying, well, this is how things actually are. So if a manager comes along and says, just work harder, they say, well, this is what we're doing. It's not possible to work harder. But there's no argument there uh, because the facts are on the wall. Uh, people can't hide from it. So if you've got a huge stack of things that are waiting to be deployed, why are you building more stuff? You've still got things that are waiting to be deployed. It makes no sense to, to write code if you can't test it. If, if things have to be tested, then why are you writing more code when you haven't tested the code you've already written. Uh, and when you visualize it on the, on the board, then you can actually see that. You can see, you can usually see, when people first get a board, they usually see a huge kind of backlog in the testers queue. Uh, and the developers can, are very good uh, at churning out code and uh, giving the testers lots of work to do, but then the testers are completely inundated with stuff. Uh, and, and unless you actually see that, visualize that, then it's, it's so easy not to do anything about it. Um, so understanding how things get from an idea into the hands of the customers is very important. And uh, how it can be done more effectively. If you visualize it, then you can see, you can try things out and the board will give you feedback about how well your changes are actually working. Uh, so you can't see, has anybody seen Kanban board before? people. So basically it's a very simple process so you can you define the, kind of the stages, the steps you kind of go through in developing software or whatever activity you're doing um, and then you can start to refactor it saying that maybe we want to write some autom automated specifications, automated tests to help us kind of understand when we've developed things and the integration process. So it's very much defining uh, the steps you do to go from an idea to getting a feature into somebody else's to the customer's hands. Um, and you can either do it on the wall, or you can do it in a net electronic um, system. Uh, and you think, th including uh, things like uh, how it's going to be shipped, how it's going to be deployed, and so on. So you can have queues for all the kind of stages you want. So it's a very kind of specific thing to your organization, how your organization works. And the more you can kind of visualize that end-to-end -end stream, the more opportunities you have for, for changing uh, and improving how you, how you do things. So talking about improvements, how many people actually monitor their serv servers and stuff like that? Quite a few, that's good. Actually, somebody monitors it, because if they go down, obviously, then there's not really going to be much software going on. Uh, but there's quite a lot of systems that are monitored, but then nobody really looks at the reports. Um, uh, which is a shame because there's lots of really cool kind of visualizations you can get. So understanding sort of network traffic on your system. So you might have an application that's slow, but it could be that it's been hammered by the network. So rather than try and kind of spend weeks and weeks trying to optimize your code, maybe maybe there's a different way you can orchestrate the the networking, uh, the infrastructure that it's running on to make it work more effectively. Um, and the one of the biggest headaches uh, that uh, the IT uh, people usually have is like disks running out of space. Uh, but if that's monitored and it's very visualized, then it's one thing that you don't have to deal with all the time. Because if uh, a disk is full uh, and your application is running, then it'll either crash or you'll lose some information, and you'll lose some customers and so on. So just something simple like that, if it's not done, uh, is, is, um, is a shame. Because you can get lots of free tools like Magviz, uh, we'll actually just visualize that all for you. Uh, and Nagos, again, it's a network monitoring tool. will produce lots of really great visualizations. Uh, and for the price of a, a large screen TV, which is a few hundred pounds, you could probably save yourself thousands of pounds. Um, I used to work for a, an, an organization that 
never always used to be running out into this kind of problem. And it used to affect their website, their website would go down, uh, and then within 20 minutes, their share price would go down. So something as simple as this can actually save a business a lot of money. Uh, you can do also things like geographical stuff. You can even have it on people's phones. So if you're rolling out new stuff, you don't actually have to. Not everybody has to be in the office when they're rolling out things. You can see information on your on your smartphones these days. Um, so you can actually be connected to what's actually going on in the business all the time without actually having the burden of being there all the time. Uh, and you can also do cool stuff like find, figuring out where that your server is in the server room if you still got physical boxes. Uh, so server provisioning. Um, does anybody, anybody still use physical boxes? Has everybody moved over to virtualization? No? A few people? So uh, if you're using virtual virtualization, if you're using uh, virtual box or VMware, so that gives so much more benefits. You can kind of get rid of all these trunky old servers. You don't have to wait for weeks and weeks to get a certain new server provisioned. And um, you can even, with, automate, with virtual machines, you can automate the provisioning and uh, have those and you can get off the shelf uh, servers. You can go to EC2, Amazon uh, Cloud, uh, and just start using a server that's already pre configured. Uh, and they're really easy to uh, manage. I mean, anybody can kind of pick this up, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, you can basically download VirtualBox and have your own server up and running within a few minutes. Um, although, uh, unless you've got slow bandwidth. <laughs> and so the really nice tool is, is Vagrant, which actually help you uh, spin up uh, a whole range of uh, virtual machines. And you can, yeah, can pre-configure uh, a whole bunch of images that, that define what's actually on, the software that's actually on your servers. Uh, and use some of the cool tools like Puppet and Chef to help, help you uh, provision to provide a server that's exactly how you want it to be. Uh, you don't have to worry about if somebody else has been playing around with it, somebody else has been messing with the settings, changing environment, environment variables. It's there, you can get on, you can deploy to that with confidence, knowing it's, it's exactly the same as a server you were using yesterday uh, because it's a brand new server. Um, and you can use a little command line through, it's very easy. This is basically install Vagrant uh, if you've got, um, well, if you've got Ruby and VirtualBox installed, install Vagrant, you can, fire it, you can tell you which virtual machine you want to use as a base, uh, initialize it and start it up, and then and off you go. So it's very easy to kind of do, to actually have an automated provisioning of this. And if you're using uh, VMware, ESX, some of the big kind of virtualization stuff, it's so easy to kind of get this stuff done. Uh, and the upshot really is having a, a very balanced and consistent environment. So again, a lot of people run into the problems of they did, well, it worked on test, well, it worked in, in it works in dev. Uh, um, we stick it in production support. We find out there's a different version of the of the operating system. Uh, it might be running a completely different operating system. Uh, developers might have Windows on their machines and it actually is deploying to a, a Unix box or a Linux box. And using things like Puppet and Chef and Rex, you can, again, you can spin up services, you can shut them down, you can do this all remotely, uh, you can do this from a central console. So it's so easy to kind of script these kind of things up and get them running. Uh, and the more opportunities you have to automate things, the more likely you can get further along the path towards uh, continuous deployment. Uh, another aspect of, of learning is actually getting involved in disaster recovery. Does anybody do disaster recovery? No? Some people? One at the back, excellent. Uh, I did this and it was a complete eye-opener. Uh, start getting involved in the disaster recovery activities uh, of the company I was working for. And you just learn so much because you, you're, you're working with the people, the server uh, admins uh, for a day, you're seeing all their, their pain, pain points, you're seeing what you could actually do to actually make their lives better because if you make them more effective you're making yourself more effective because you can ship more to them more often um, and you, you kind of learn that things that they don't like getting huge kind of deployment documents they don't want a, like a 50 page deployment document they want a script they can run uh, and they can do that remotely and uh, 
they can do it all at home with watching TV and then they only have to really put some effort into it if something goes wrong. And then if something goes wrong, oh, you've given them another script, which is a rollback, and they just run that. And, and then you give them another script, which is the test to make sure the rollback works and everything's fine, and they're very happy. And they'll do that every night because it doesn't, it's not a big burden on them. But if you give them a 50-page document to deploy in a very manual process, then they're not going to do it very often. They'll do it once a month, and they'll put limits on what you can actually do. So your ability to continue to deploy will be uh, very constrained. Uh, and the same with change freeze as well. You often find out what's the most valuable thing uh, that happens in your organization when you have a change freeze, because those are things that actually keep on going to deployment, even though everything else is not allowed. Uh, so that's quite a good learning, uh, learning environment when you have a change freeze, because you find out not everything freezes. Uh, this is the one. Um, so for deployment strategies, if it hurts, then do it more often. So if something is challenging, don't shy away from it. Do it as often as you can. So if, if deployment is hard, and deployment to live is hard, then do deployment, but deploy it to a non-production environment to actually just do run-throughs to get it as smooth as possible. Because the last thing you want is issues when you're deploying to production because it causes lots of stress, lots of ineffective work to, to happen. So there's lots of opportunities. If you've got balanced environments, it's very easy to kind of deploy to a production support system over and over again. You do that day in, day out if you wanted to, to actually get that as smooth as possible. So when you actually come to production, it, it's child's play. Uh, another aspect is considering seg segmented deploys. So again, not deploying to every customer. And if you might have customers that are more friendly to your, to your business than others, uh, or you, you might have uh, customers that have got a long relationship. So work with them saying, well, we've got some new features, are you interested in them? Get that feedback circle going. So de deploying to them more often, uh, they will uh, forgive you a few slips uh, and, they, and they'll allow you to roll back. And that gives you confidence that your know, process is getting better. And once you're kind of deploying like on a more regular basis to them, you can widen that to the rest of the customers who are a little bit more change averse. So understanding your customers, again, is an important aspect of continuous deployment. And deploying stuff that's only as timely. If it's not valuable to deploy it now, then why are you working on it? And again, this is a very hard question because it's something that the business people don't really uh, take time to appreciate either. Uh, when should you actually deploy stuff? When is it more valuable to deploy uh, a software system? That's a very hard question. So if you go for smaller deployments, it makes it a lot more easier because you're doing a small piece. Uh, it takes less work to create, it takes less work to deploy. Uh, so you get feedback sooner. So feedback on how well you've deployed it, feedback how well it's actually working uh, as something valuable for the customer you've given it to. Um, and so one thing I haven't really found is, is a good way to kind of visualize these deployment strategies. So that's something I'm kind of looking for. If you have any ideas, then please send me that. Uh, managing your code. Um, we're going to go through this a little bit quick, but if you have any questions, then let me know. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, this is an approach I hope you don't use. Um, it's not the best approach. Hey. Uh, yay! <laughs> That's not an endorsement, it's an endorsement of the slide, not the activity. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a, a very, kind of, it's like a diabolical developer's attitude to, uh, to writing code. You can't just compile it and ship it, that's not what uh, continuous deployment is about. Um, I, hope, I hope I've kind of got that over to you so far. Um, so, I hope somebody, I hope everybody's kind of using some kind of um, automated build tool. <coughs> The people using Maven or Ant, people using nothing or oh, not admitting to it. Okay. So there, there are a wide range to choose from. There's, there's build tools for every kind of language, so there's no reason to, kind of, to not use them these days. Uh, although some of the Maven configs are a little bit scary, uh, but again, there, there are tools to help you manage that. Uh, and local repositories. Um, Things like Nexus and Artifactory allow you to kind of build up your own software library and manage your own software library locally. Um, 
if you use Maven, you might have the experience of having to download the internet every time. If you use a local repository, then that manages that for you and it keeps the versions for you as well. And also, it gets you to think about versioning your own software in the same kind of way. So, whether you like Maven or hate Maven, some of the concepts are very valuable for continuous deployment because you're thinking about versioning your software, you're thinking about modularization of your software. If you're also using uh, things like uh, Git and so on, you're again also, it's another opportunity to compartmentalize the bits of functionality that you're actually creating. Uh, some of the build tools also have this continuous feedback loop as well. Uh, so I haven't really tried it with Maven 3, but um, there's the idea there in a simple build tool, which is a Scala build tool. So you can basically type in on the command line, you can type in uh, tests, and whenever you save your changes to the file, that, uh, the code you're writing, it will run the, the, the tests, the, the unit tests, or, or any kind of test framework you have automatically and it will work out the best kind of test, the most obvious test to run, so it runs really quickly. So you get fast feedback on whether your car, not just if your code compiles, but does it run, does it pass all the tests that you define as well. So it's a great way to kind of understand if you're actually making progress in the right direction. And if you couple this with acceptance tests, like in BDD, then you also get some idea about how much progress you are towards done. Um, and just an aside, again, um, there's some cool languages there that give you this idea of the REPL, which is like a runtime environment, so you can test things out, you can get fast feedback about how well you're actually using that language. So again, the more you understand the language, the more you understand how you're shipping, how you're, how you're creating uh, the, the runnable executables from that uh, language, uh, and whether it's passing tests, it all gives you valuable fast feedback uh, about whether you're actually doing the right kind of thing. Uh, so, there's been a lot of talk over the last 5, 10, 15 years about testable code. And so, we're thinking more about um, behavior driven development. So, it's kind of grown into not just does it, uh, does it pass a test, but is it, is it exhibiting the right behavior? Is it doing the right things for the customer? Um, uh, and uh, can we really kind of tie up what the code is doing with what we're actually expressing? in terms of requirements. So if you haven't used uh, BDD, there's a very really nice uh, sort of given then when way of defining requirements, which is very easy to tie to the code you're writing. So when you run uh, your accept when you're running your test framework, it actually tells you whether you're actually satisfying the requirements that we defined. Um, so what I'm really getting at here is the, the idea of um, deployable software. So taking all these ideas and saying, well, is my software testable? Is my software deployable? Can, am I writing software? Am I designing software in a way that makes it easy to deploy? And if you're making it smaller, if you're making uh, it, it very testable, if you're surrounding it by acceptance test framework, then it becomes more uh, deployable. Um, it, it was more likely to kind of meet the business needs and if you're making small things, you can readjust it. So if you deploy one thing one week uh, and it, it's of no business value, you can actually get rid of it. You can actually replace it with a new version or you can take that functionality away because taking away functionality is also an effective way to deliver a system. You know, I mean, if, you look at, um, if you look at Microsoft Office, it does everything under the sun. But how many of those features do you actually use? Uh, I use uh, maybe about five. Five six, so I, I'd be quite happy if they took all those away, all the rest of them away, and just give me the five or six uh, uh, tools I need for creating a word document, uh, and made it much quicker and faster and, and easier experience. So if you don't need that software, it shouldn't be there because it's just a, a potential for bugs. Um, so who's using some kind of distributed version control? It's a few people. Uh, if you aren't using it, then I seriously suggest looking at it. Again, it's another way to kind of uh, modularize the, the code you're doing. It's a great way to, uh, to get developers to collaborate on software. Uh, and it's a great way to um, get people sharing their ideas and code very easily. Uh, with, with Subversion, a lot of people kind of are afraid of sort of checking in stuff. So there's a lot of discussions about what we could do. With, 
With distributed version control, you can show people what you've done, and then you can decide whether that's valuable or not. So again, people can go off and try things in a safe way, and then pull anything in that's useful. Um, so the, to use Git, if you've not used it before, it's very simple. The only kind of real difference really is, instead of having uh, one master repository that you just deploy your working files to, you've got your own complete copy of that repository. This is why uh, Git repositories are actually smaller, and why you, uh, why you make components with Git, because you don't want to have a, a massive repository that you're having to sync all the time. Uh, if you have a repository for each component, uh, and you've got that all organized and made and build, then it's very effective to kind of just work on the components and the repositories you are you need to, you need to have in hand. Uh, and it allows you to kind of be experimental and, and do a lot of things in your own local repository, and if it's valuable, then you can push it out to uh, the, the, the online, the, the official kind of code repository. In what way does, it, does, does, does that make it easier to sort of do that kind of experimental uh, kind of work than, than, than doing it in a branch in a well, version? The, the, the main difference is, uh, is, is merging things back together again. With, with distributed version and control, there, there's more functionality, and I'm, I'm going to go and touch on that in a second. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this basically conceptualized. So you've got your local repos, you can have different repositories for different aspects of your, the software you're, you're building, so you don't just have one big repository. Uh, uh, and then you can have people or roles uh, for people that are responsible for pulling in uh, all the great stuff uh, and chucking away all the, the bad stuff that you don't want. Uh, and then it makes it very easy to kind of have a, like a, a, a repository that is the authority of one, that's where you deploy from, uh, and you could even kind of wire it up to other tools that will help you just kind of automatically deploy. So, that's not a very good picture. Um, that's a better one. So this is kind of a, a sort of visualization of the, the history uh, of a distributed version control. So, all these dots are they're not, not changes, but they're change sets. So in, in something like Subversion, you get uh, a, a, different, a difference between one version and the next. Here, you're actually getting a change set, something that's changed from one version to the next. Uh, and you can have lots of different branches and, uh, of things happening. And it's very easy to kind of see where the whole history of, of what's actually happened uh, and pull in specific change sets. Uh, and you can see the relationships between, between those change sets as well. So you can kind of, and if you have to, you kind of kind of work backwards uh, and see the most optimal way to kind of merge your changes. And a lot of tools will actually help you kind of automate th this merging. Where so rather than have like um, six months where you haven't merged any branches in Subversion, you could have uh, at the same time of in a distributed version control, and you could work your way back to six months. So if you couldn't merge it in Subversion, you have a better chance of merging it. In, in a distributed version control because you can work your way backwards and start to merge the changes back and go all, all the way backwards and forwards between the, the entire history of, of that version control system. So it makes it so much easier to, to manage and work with change to be a bit more exper experimental. And there are some nice tools to help you do that. So here's an example. So when you're doing kind of code reviews, so somebody's done a code review and they've seen an issue, so somebody else will Go, go back to their own local repository, make some changes, uh, and put some more, what they call a push request. So this is the change I've made. Please consider this push request uh, to be included into the, the main repository. So that's how it works. So you can have lots of these going on, and people can understand which changes to include. Oh, so much easier. Uh, I'm going to skip this question. Yeah. So that slide was based on Git, right? Uh, get uh, the, the request. Uh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. Are you aware of any uh, reasonable tool that can do that in a program? Uh, if you have a look at um, Fish Eye. Which one? Fish Eye. Fish Eye? Yeah, it's from Atlassian. Um, okay. But uh, there probably are other ones. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have to say that one. I'm really glad to do that. Uh, but Fish Eye uh, has got a nice uh, uh, graph. Uh, to do for visual, it, it's for distributed version controls. It, it can also do the same thing, thing for subversion as well, but it, it's just harder because you're you're not dealing with change sets. It's 
the actual changes, the actual merging is more challenging because you've got less information. But to visualize it, you can do that on any, any of the distributions. The, the question was really about a formal review process, like, you know, you, you don't really want to pull something that other folks are doing, you want to review that stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, so it, it should be, so when you're actually building stuff, the part of continuous de deployment absolutely should have a code review section in it. So when you're deploying to, um, um, to your kind of, so you should have really have code reviews here before you're actually pulling things into the main, uh, the component repositories. Uh, so do you want to accept somebody else's pull request? Have a code review, it's the simplest way to do it. Uh, and, and if somebody is, is doing good stuff, then maybe you don't review everything. So you, again, you can evaluate the risk of promoting code towards live, if you see what I mean. And you can use the tools, the visualize, visualization tools to help you see what's actually going on. Um, am I wrong with this? It's just got set lessons for Jira and FishEye, but we don't yet have FishEye. Okay. I'm up and running because the guy was looking at it said that he thought we needed to get our subversion repository and sort it out a wee bit first. Yeah. Would you recommend that we probably don't even bother with that and just look to sort of migrate to Mercurial instead? Let, let, let's talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. I will say a nice way around that is to use Git, which then pushes to a central SVN. Yeah, yeah. So you can a way to get, get there. Oh, yeah, probably do the yeah. job afterwards. Because this, this could be subversion, and this could be Git. So you don't have to have it exclusively, exclusively one or the other. Uh, what did we get to? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Is there anyone? Uh, how long have we got left? Uh, oops. Two minutes. So uh, the problem with... Um, so version is again, people are, are worried about checking things into the, the main trunk because if they break the bill, uh, the bill body goes goes ape, and uh, they, they or the wall board goes ape, and it, it, it kind of puts them off. It puts them uh, puts developers off collaborating. So the more barriers you can take away from that, again, people will talk about stuff, people will try things out, uh, and they won't be just spending all their time kind of uploading stuff to GitHub and uh, Bitbucket. On, on the side, just to try things out. They'll actually be doing that inside the company. Uh, I'm going to skip a few things. Uh, so continuous integration, we're all doing continuous integration. We've all got Jenkins, Bamboo, or something like that. Yeah. Um, so again, it's, it doesn't just have to be um, uh, just building uh, your components. Um, it can be more uh, about kind of visualizing what's actually going on. So you can, you can create all sorts of wallboards from uh, your CI servers, lots of information, lots of reporting that's going on. Here's a, what we call a, um, a cumulative flow diagram. It actually shows um, so how long a piece of work is taking from going like, to do, in progress, and to done. And you can put deployments sort of stages in there. So you can actually see very, very clearly how long like, things average, typically take uh, to do. Um, and that way, you don't have to sort of have so much discussion about estimation, because if you can actually see how long things are, uh, are taking to get from idea to deployment, then you can you can see what the bottlenecks are, you can see if you've got any kind of cadence and any kind of predictability, and um, uh, then if somebody says how long is it going to take, you can say well it, it typically takes about a week to get, kind of do that size of work. So that's something again to help you get closer towards and see whether you're actually getting closer towards continuous deployment. And you can do other fun stuff as well, like make lots of pretty lights, Christmas tree lights with your CI service and build bunnies and so on. Uh, one thing to do, be aware of with, the ultimate, uh, with your wallboards is to um, not to drown them with information. These, these are pretty good. Uh, any much more than that, you kind of get the information overload, people wouldn't use them. One neat trick they did here was um, if, if the board needed attention, uh, they actually changed the color of the light actually behind the board. They had LEDs behind the board and they actually changed it. So uh, you can get little red dots here, but people kind of get wallboard blindness sometimes. So it's very hard to kind of, um, once, once you get familiar with the board, then um, it's, uh, it's very easy just to, to kind of ignore it. But if there's more visual clues, of the whole thing, it has like a, you can even have like a, a red banner all the way around it that flashed if there was a, a problem. Um, uh, you can have things like issue trackers or news or something that gets people to kind of look at the, the wallboard 
uh, that's attached to something important. Uh, so usually most wallboards are kind of attached to your CI server. Uh, and if you can get people to look at it on a regular basis, then they can see all, all sorts of interesting things happening. You can plug in your, uh, your network monitoring uh, or your, your uh, disk space monitoring, anything that's important, uh, even cycle through windows. Stuff that gets people more attuned to actually what's going on within the IT organization and even, even business stuff. You can even have uh, your stock level on there as well. Again, it keeps people interested in what's actually going on in the business. And you can do all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff there. And if you want to look a lot more, there's uh, something called ultimatewallboard.com, which uh, is a, it's about, I think it's about 87 different examples of wallboards that people have created, both physical and electronic. Um, so it's more for compiling code. So it is, again, it is an example of kind of putting it all together. I uh, appreciate that we've run out of time. Uh, but, so the idea here is um, okay, it's, you've been through all the kind of development, code reviews, checked it in. It's attached to uh, a deployment. The business person's very happy with it. They can press an OK button uh, in either Green Opera Jira or some other tool, some other sort of uh, project management tool or planning tool. Uh, it fires off your CI server, which pulls out the latest code from the repository, from your authority repository that you deploy from. Uh, you can use Vagrant uh, or Maven or both uh, to kind of spin up virtual machines. Uh, and, therefore, and, and within a few minutes, you have like a system that's live that your customers could actually use. Um, so your decisions are, how do you configure all this for the, the actual value proposition you're delivering? So which customers are you going to? Which boxes are you spinning up? Um, how much are you doing? Are you deploying it locally? Are you going to spin up some EC2 instances? Um, what are there all the actions that your CI server is going to use? How many of the uh, the unit tests and the acceptance test you run first. So this can be a matter of seconds or it could be a matter of hours, it could be even a matter of days, this kind of process. So it, again, the continuous development, continuous uh, deployment is going to be very unique to your kind of organization. Um, most of that. So final thoughts. Uh, yeah, so again, one, one thing that I would take away from this is try and do smaller and smaller tasks. Uh, whatever you're doing anyway it helps, regardless of whether it's software or learning something. Doing things in smaller bites gets you a lot more progress, gives you a lot more feedback. Uh, and it also helps you understand your capability, especially if you have something like a Kanban board to help you visualize the work you're doing. Uh, use the, the right kind of tools to communicate effectively, so like have wikis to be able to communicate information. Uh, and get an understanding about what's actually going on, what the impact of your work is around you as well. So, um, this is an example of Google Analytics. So, if your business, what's your business doing? If you deploy something, how how is that meaningful to the company, to the customers, to you? This kind of gives you a better uh, feeling of what well, your your value really within the organisation. Um, so, there's lots of different things you can do. Uh, so, I hope this is giving you lots of ideas and. Um, There'll be quite a lot of interesting blogs I can read on what you've been doing uh, in the next six months. Um, and again, so the more you deploy, the less risk you have. So again, try and do it more often. Even if it's even if you go from once every six one from once a year to once every six months, that's a huge change. That's a huge improvement. So again, you're going to be set with your own particular challenges. Uh, so but the more you can do to move towards it, the more benefit you'll get. And uh, thank you very much. Cool. Uh, I'm not quite sure if we're running late or not, but uh, if there's any questions. I do about um, the frequency of the deployments. Yeah. In, in Playfish, uh, I'll use the same social as an example. And that team, I mean, uh, just the server side, that's getting bigger and bigger. So we changed the process that everyone's committed to trunk at the moment. Because uh, previous to that, um, everyone was working in their own branch, then they would do this horrific merge to the end of it. Yeah. So we're just going directly to trunk now, where we've always got CI running. So we are failing fast. Yeah. Then if we were to do a continuous delivery, um, there's potentially uh, 20 different commits from around the team in a window of about 15 minutes, that would clearly be overkill. 
And yeah. I don't know if um, you would generally stagger it um, in that sort of situation. Yeah, it, it's kind of you have to understand your capability to not just get feedback, but actually understand that feedback as well. Uh, and so, if you're if you're doing all these different commits together, and then you run CI, then there's the potential that you're not understanding what's actually going on. If you if you do one commit and run CI, then it's very clear to understand the feedback. It's very simple to understand it. Where, but it, and it's the same with a deployment. If you're doing if you're deploying one thing. Uh, and then you can spend a night an hour seeing how the impact of that is on the system. Then if there's a problem, then you know it's that thing that you've deployed. Uh, if there's a problem with the CI, then you know it's the thing you've checked into the repository. So the more you're doing, the more you're checking into a repository at any particular time, it adds to, it makes it more complex to understand what the feedback you're receiving. Um, so it might be that it's going to depend on what actually you're actually trying to, you're actually capturing what feedback you're actually getting. If, if the feedback is, is compiled, it runs all the tests, uh, it, it might be acceptable to kind of do that. Or you might find that it, actually your tests aren't doing enough or, or doing the right kind of things. Um, so it, it's very hard to kind of specifically say, but to think about what kind of feedback you're getting, what does that actually mean to you? Is it helping you uh, understand what's going on? Is it helping you to improve? So I would, at a very loose way, I'd try, try it, basically, uh, and see if it makes a difference. See if you actually get a better understanding or not. If you don't get any difference in your level of understanding, then keep on doing what you were doing, if it's more effective. We need to make some cloud visas set so up. We're moving away from it last year, unfortunately. Not my decision. Right, OK. Yeah, again, it's, this is not really about tools. Uh, it's, about, uh, it's about the end goal of uh, trying to make the company more effective by making the parts that make the company work more effective and, uh, and trying to understand how to do that in a very holistic way and as, as part of that whole organization kind of moving forward. It's not just, not just developers get writing better code, but writing the right code at the right time, uh, being able to deploy that when it's needed, when it's valuable, uh, to remove things that aren't needed, that aren't valuable. There's a lot of companies that are have these big, have these nice kind of uh, green screen terminals, uh, green screen applications that are probably fine, but they take so long to actually deploy onto them to actually make any changes. Then the company is hampered by their effectiveness to to bring something new to the table, and that might be fine in a in an organisation where the business doesn't change, like like insurance. Uh, most companies that they, they don't really change what they're doing. It's very very simple. So these green green screen terminals. Have never been replaced because they they run at the speed of the business. Um, but if your business runs faster or needs to change, or other people come in uh, and start doing things differently in your business sector, then that's when the problems occur. Because even in insurance, now that people are starting to do things differently, starting to change the way they address and work with their customers, and a lot of the traditional uh, insurance companies are struggling. Uh, they're having to kind of change a lot of the big systems they're doing after deploying and adapting a lot more quickly to the market because there's becoming a market in their industry and it's it shocked a lot of uh, companies. Yeah, yeah you, you switch is a classic example of that. So you, you switch has enforced a massive change here in the UK. Yeah. And, and the couple of insurance companies that are kind of following the U-Switch model are the only ones who keep up with consumers that actually do constantly switch between providers. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, been really disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, just imagine if, if people change their insurance policy every six months. I mean, most companies couldn't do that. Most companies couldn't handle their their systems couldn't handle that. They couldn't handle. It, it would take them months to actually do that do that kind of change, because it's not it's not an easy change for them because they have that so much kind of technical debt that surrounds them, uh, and they don't even look at how to kind of address that. Either. All right, uh, I'm sure the next session is probably about starting. Sure. Okay, great. So if you've got more questions, please uh, please feel free to ask, uh, or otherwise enjoy a coffee. Thanks very much. Thank you.
So you keep the version, keep the version as it is, uh, and one option is to put a, a distributed version control system around it and actually make repos around it. And you can run the run the fish eye of those repositories. You don't have to run off of the subversion option. But you may find that if it's a very large repository, then uh, fish eye takes a long time to process. Uh, because it has to go through everything and just a lot of changes. It's yeah, that's probably yeah, yeah, that, 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 that might be the thing that he's kind of thinking. Uh, the colleague I think was taking on the lines of the uh, main things that are having multiple repositories rather than one single thing. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, probably yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, And that'd be another side. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you understand your code base very well, then it's probably it'll be a lot easier to move to material. How well your components are designed, but you've got separate kind of areas in your uh, subversion. So if it's organised in components, which is in the repository, then I make it very easy. Yeah. If it's, it's sensibly organised, which again it isn't easy to do because a lot of what we do is organically gross, and then what was sensible six months ago is probably completely wrong now. It, it kind of quickly. But it's, um, yeah, but it's still hard to do. Uh, yeah, but certainly, if you if you're not sure, then trying something, trying it around it, or material around it, um, makes it easier uh, to test it out. Uh, it's not a, it's not a such a big change. But if there's obvious things, you can say, oh, we can obviously take this stuff, stuff out of the version and stick it in another repository. Um, then that's something you can. Uh, if, if, if there's if there's a lower risk, then that's something you can just get straight away. The other thing, uh, what I guess. Depends if you actually if you can do it without losing any useful information as well because obviously the uh, subversion has a lot of useful checking information but, um, um, and you want to be kind of make sure you can keep that if it's useful. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would I would try yeah because I mean a lot of developers well I mean you can try on a, 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 if you if you try and do a new project you can kind of try materials straight off and just do it in there. Uh, and again, because you can always kind of push that to subversion, um, or or just yeah, just uh, just work around your existing, so you don't have to kind of I guess one say you don't have to kind of throw subversion away straight away. Yeah. Um, you don't have to throw it away at all. But uh, but there are advantages in doing it, and people will have to kind of learn how to use material and how to use it well, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how to understand what they want to get out of it as well. So. It, 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 again, small steps are uh, usually better um, than a big, big change. So, is that all? Yeah, so, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Did you find the talk interesting then? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, entirely sure what it was going to be about, but, but, but that's a fact. Um, I was dealing with uh, um, many things that uh, mm. uh, uh, so, yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it was kind of high level, uh, and I was trying to get people to think about the whole, the whole kind of picture. So, yeah. so again, it, it's kind of hard to come into mind, but in the, the blur that they kind of allow you to write about the talk. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of evolved a bit as well from when they used to make the talks about six months ago. Is that and, um, yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. And, so, and then kind of your thoughts evolved over six months ago, so there's a lot of extra stuff I put in even, even just in the last couple of weeks. Alright, thanks very much. Yeah, cheers. And um, so I'm actually, uh, I actually work for a lot of students. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's too late for me, hopefully. Um, so are you, are you guys based in UK? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, this is an Andrews. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, because I'm the UK um, ambassador for Atlassian, because we don't really have an office thing. So, yeah. so I'm, so I'm kind of doing a sort of community development. So I'm like a developer in the community that's developing yeah. the community. Um, so, yeah, if you can, if you have any more questions, I can definitely get up and get in touch. Um, it's good to know what people are doing with that stuff as well, what challenges they have, and what interesting stories to come out of that as well. So,